need to say that this Sunday um, and reading this text um, and getting ready for it was very personally um, convicting um, for me. This is a really hard text from Hebrews, and I have a personal confession to make. I don't know if I've ever read it before. Um, the passage right before this of, you know, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, so let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and run this race looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. All of that and the roll call of faith that we've just come through sharing together, those are some of my favorite passages. Um, so it's very telling that we go from one of my favorites to one I don't know if I've read um, before. And it's really tricky um, and hard. Um, Rob and Mike, could I ask that we bring and go back um, to the Hebrew scriptures on the slide? Um, so there's a lot to catch. Um, and, and also, if you note, our first two hymns were um, just a tad bit awkward for us, right? They weren't very familiar. So here's the deal, guys. Um, we've been very centered in God's imminence. God's nearness, God's with us. And that's my theological bread and butter and candy. And you will hear me uh, way too often talk about God as Emmanuel and God with us and all that means and my obsession with all of things um, relational. Today um, is a little bit about God's transcendence, about God's otherness. And I think it's telling that the hymns that talk and speak to God's transcendence, we don't know very well. And the scripture passages that speak to God's transcendence, at least I, don't know very well. And so this is a moment um, to gather ourselves um, and to think about how we come to worship. You have not come to something that can be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken. Not another word. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Last night, Abraham and I were watching a mock horror movie, and my even knowing that it was something making fun of horror movies, so it wasn't supposed to be scary, my breath was still quickened, I was still clenching and nervous, and I was holding on to Abraham way too tightly to admit here. Um, have we ever thought of coming to worship that way? Have we ever thought of worshiping and expecting from worship that fear, that fretful anticipation that I, at least, um, immediately associate with a horror flick? I want to share with you a quote um, from author Annie Dillard um, that says, i got to find it here. I swear I have a, there we go. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of the power we so blithely invoke? It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our peers. Now, contrary we can go back to the um, fire slide. So contrary to the great imagery that Mike has provided for us, this is not going to go into a fire and brimstone sermon. Um, I'm not okay with manipulating fear and preying on people's emotions like that. But neither am I comfortable going the exact opposite way, that we never are afraid, or never, even worse, expect to be afraid when we encounter the mystery of God. That's an arrogance, quite frankly, that borders on sinfulness and is definitely heretical. Because God is other, 
God is more and God is beyond. And the danger of focusing only on God's nearness and God's imminence and God's closeness is that before we even realize it, the power balance can shift in that. And all of a sudden, we who are the created beings begin to think of ourselves as creator with a trusty advisor that we keep in our back pocket to pull out when we need to check in or reminisce. Now, there's nothing wrong with feeling close. We have the whole incarnation and the reason that God came to walk with us. But a reversal of power and of who we are is. And so this Sunday is kind of a theological balancing of the ship. We're leaning towards imminence. Um, and we're going to weigh down the transcendence a little bit to bring us back to even keel. Because here's the thing. As much as I want to feel the closeness of God, I don't want just a coach or a therapist I can keep in my back pocket and dial up when I need. When I see the hell the refugees have fled, when I look at pictures of charred circles that used to be whole villages in Darfur, when I read and see the broken bodies of our brothers and sisters of color, when I hear of children abducted and trafficked, I want more than a back pocket coach. I want an all-consuming fire. I want a God who can come and burn through such evil and break it shaking it in its very foundations and core and consuming every tentacle that has extended and enmeshed itself in any and every part of who we are in our world. I want it gone. I want the possibility of it gone. And we need a God this powerful. It's not easy, but we need it. There is a lot that we will encounter in our lives. There is a lot of suffering that we will hear and learn and know about. But what the author of Hebrews is doing is giving us a warning. And we're not alone in getting unbalanced. Before the canon of our scripture was closed, this author of Hebrews wrote to the church community begging them to remember fear in coming before a God who is other and who is more and who is beyond us. This author used Mount Sinai um, to remember because that was the closest theophany, the closest experience of faith that this community had yet had before Jesus. And the author begs us to remember what happened at Sinai, how people got tired of waiting for God and so out popped a golden calf that they had melted together and here, you know, decided a new way for moving forward on their own terms because they didn't want to wait so long for Moses to come down at the mountain and hear a word from God who had just rescued them from slavery. And God was furious. And God sent a plague to blot out those who had sinned against God. And that was after two intercessions from Moses. But here's the thing that this Sunday won't let us off the hook of. We very easily rationalize, well, that was the Hebrew scriptures, God, and we have the new and improved shepherd dad Jesus and God now that we have Jesus here with us. Our scripture today is one of fear and of warning and of God as fire, and it is in the New Testament. This is a part of who God is. And the author is saying, you thought it was bad at Mount Sinai? Y'all are crazy. That was the human earth watered down version. That wasn't God in God's full divine glory in heaven with the assembly of the firstborn and all of the angels and Jesus Christ in the full trinity. That was 
what God chose to show us here on earth, walking through, so, working through someone who was human. What we're talking about Mount Sinai is the fullness of who God is in all of God's divinity and power. And so if you think we couldn't escape Mount Sinai, how the heck do you think we're not, we're going to escape Mount Zion? And so the author is calling us to even more fear and reverence and awe. And yes, I want a good shepherd way more than I want a judge or an accuser. But the fact is that God is against sin. And in part, that means that God is against us. The sinful, false selves we had created. Think of the mesh of excuses and rationalizations and projections and escape ways or ways of escape that we do to, you know, present something or make an official story or self-diagnose. Whether we turn to addictions or religiosity, however we weave and concoct this image to fit into whatever group we want to be accepted into or whatever worldview or image, this is the false self and the mesh of crazy that God will burn through to find our true selves and to burn up every evil. I want to be comforted way more than I want to be convicted. But I stand here today with you all because of unfree land and unfree labor. And I'd rather not face that. I'd rather not face the good neighborhoods and schools I have been redlined to have the privilege of receiving over and against my neighbors of color. I'd rather not face um, how I have used religion in the past and how I have used it today. Um, there was a moment where I was um, preparing for my ordination candidacy and went through my South evaluation and very confidently told that person that I knew that I was better than other people because I didn't do drugs. Evidently, I did do some pretty arrogant religiosity. There's a lot that has to be burnt through, that has to be cleaned up, that has to be consumed. And it's scary (laughs) and it's terrifying. And there will be moments where I have begged and I will beg, beg for not one more word. But it's a process and something that I am committed to and that in my best days and on my worst days, I still really, really want and try to be committed to because of what it means for all of us and for our world. Because I want a God who can establish an unshakable kingdom of justice and of joy of life made abundant for every single person and for all creation, not just for some at the expense of others. I want to close with words from two other preachers. This is from George MacDonald. Can it be any comfort to us to be told that God loves us so that God will burn us clean? Can the cleansing of the fire appear to us anything beyond what it must always, more or less, be a process of torture? Can we do other than fear God, even with the fear of the wicked, until we learn to love God with the love of the holy? And from Gray Temple, remember that parable of the wedding banquet? And the king who threw out a guest who wore no wedding robe, even when the guest had clearly not anticipated going to a wedding that day when leaving home? Well, know this. It was up to the host at that time to supply suitable robes to invited guests. This man had refused the offer, likely insisting that he was okay as he was. This is the parable that's for us. This is what we're talking about in God as judge and God as fire. 
Does God invite us? Yes. Are we fit to be present? Not yet. But the good news is that there is an unavoidable mercy that God extends to us. A mercy that will set us free from our false selves. And a mercy that will build a kingdom of shalom, of whole peace. And so, with a God who is unimaginably powerful and beyond us, a God who created us and still loves us, a God who extends an invitation to us to be partners in building a kingdom that is unshakable. This is our gospel invitation. This is our call as church. And this is why the author of Hebrews asks us to come to worship with reverence and with awe. Amen.